Hello, uh, my name is Phil. I'm the priest in charge of the Draycott and Lem Valley Benefice, and this is my sermon for Sunday the 20th of November. And I'm just going to pray before we read the reading. So Lord God, we thank you for the gift of your word. And as we come to reflect and explore it together now, we pray you may speak to us, that you may challenge us, and that you may encourage us. Amen. So our reading this morning comes from the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 23, starting at verse 1. Woe to you, the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done, declares the Lord. I myself will gather up the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them and will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord when I will rise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our righteous saviour. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites up, Israelites up out of Egypt. But they will say, as surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them, and they will live in their own land. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I wonder if you've ever trusted someone and immediately wished that you hadn't. Um, I did drama for GCSE. And in one of our drama lessons, we were doing some trust exercises in groups. And we were doing the one uh, where you have to sort of slowly lean backwards until you fall, uh, knowing that the rest of your group is going to catch you. And I was in a really nice group, which included some of my very best friends who I really, really trusted. Unfortunately, uh, my trust in them was so unshakable uh, that I didn't think to check with them that they were ready before I leant back. Thankfully, uh, the room was carpeted, and aside from a few bruises, I was fine. But sometimes, uh, when we trust people who are meant to be caring for us and looking after us, they can let us down. And sometimes when this happens, it's a bit more serious uh, than a few carpet bruises. And it's easy to see this, I think, if we look at a na national picture of where we are right now. When we hear the words Bernard's Castle, or party gate. We're reminded that when as a nation we were locked down, keeping away from loved ones, those who are in governments, those who are meant to be leading and looking after us, were not obeying the rules they were making and they were not looking after us. Um, I try really hard not to be party political uh, when I stand in the pulpit and I know that I'm not alone in this. I think most clergy and most people that preach try not to be party political. Uh, but when that news of Partygate and Dominic Cummings' trip to Bernard Castle broke, uh, I had a sense that many people felt more willing to be critical of the government in the pulpit. And I think there was a reason for that, because actually it's not about left and right. It's not about what policies may or may not work well for our country. It wasn't even about competence. It was about those in a position of authority who were tasked with looking after the nation at a really difficult time and they chose their own freedom and they chose to look after themselves rather than people they were in office to protect. Uh, so when I criticise them I'm not criticising them from a party political uh, perspective. Because the thing is there's something about betrayal by someone you are meant to be able to trust that makes it so much worse. That's why we are so appalled when we hear stories of abuse of children by their parents, or when we hear stories of abuse in care homes by res of residents by their carers. The people causing these vulnerable people harm are the very people 
who are meant to be looking after them. That's why adultery is so damaging. It's betrayal by the one person in the world who stood up publicly to promise to care for you and be faithful to you. And I know it's very easy for me to stand in the pulpit or <laughs> to look at this computer uh, and sound judgmental and slag off governments uh, and whatever. But the truth is we all let people down and actually there are times when I let you down um, as my congregations. Uh, there's a really powerful part in the ordination service uh, when the bishop says to those who are about to become priests, in the name of the Lord, we bid you remember the greatness of the trust that is now to be committed to your charge. Remember always with thanksgiving that the treasure now entrusted to you is Christ's own flock, bought by the shedding of his blood on the cross. It's to him that you will render account for your stewardship of his people. Those of us in positions of leadership in the church are in a position of trust and the reality is there are times when we will let you down and I hope and pray I can keep them to smaller things that you'll be able to give hopefully just the odd email that I tell you I will send but then forget but the reality is there's already been times in my short time here when I've had to hold up my hands and say sorry to people I messed that up and I'm afraid there will be more because as much as I try to be trustworthy I'm only human and there's a danger that I'm making this about me, which it really isn't, because actually we all have relationships of trust where we don't completely live up to our responsibilities, whether that's as a parent, as brothers and sisters, as employees or employers, as neighbours, as members of the church community, as members of the wider community. We all let people down who matter to us and we're all let down by those who we care about and trust as well. Our reading from Jeremiah was written to a nation who'd been really let down by their leaders, specifically their monarchs. Jeremiah is an interesting book. Uh, it's a bit of a hodgepodge. Uh, Jeremiah was a prophet in Judah between 627 and 587 BC. And the book is lots of snippets of little prophecies, prophecies that he's had across his career, uh, but they're not necessarily uh, put in the, same, in the right order in the book. Uh, and that's especially compounded by the fact that he's a prophet at a very turbulent time for Judah. And he's a prophet at a time of a lot of change going on in the Middle East. Uh, so at the beginning of his career, Judah, where he lived, uh, was nominally a kind of vassal state of Assyria. Uh, and then shortly after that, there's a brief period where Judah's independent. Uh, then it becomes a vassal of Egypt. And then finally, it becomes a vassal of Babylon under whom Nebuchadnezzar is going to take her king into exile and destroy uh, the city of Jerusalem and destroy the temple. So Jeremiah lived through all of this and he was prophesying into all of this. Uh, he had the really unenviable task of foreseeing and warning about the Babylonian invasion and then having to be there to watch it unfold. Uh, across the book, uh, he weeps over Israel many times, uh, which has led to him getting the nickname the Weeping Prophet. Uh, so our passage uh, comes from the tail end of a section that's talking about the threat to Judah posed by the Babylonians. Uh, our passage is about a dialogue between Jeremiah and Zedekiah, the king of Judah. And Jeremiah is telling, telling Zedekiah what is about to happen. And it's really not going to be fun. The Babylonians are coming and it will be carnage. Uh, Jeremiah is also telling the king that it's the king's fault this is happening because he's been a bad king. He's been leading Judah astray. He's been leading Judah towards idolatry. And as I said, this passage that we just read is the end of this section uh, and it ends with Jeremiah telling off the king for being a bad shepherd who hasn't looked after his flock who are now going to be scattered. But it does have hope in it. Uh, the verses we read is where it kind of switches uh, to some glimmers of hope. Uh, so firstly, Jeremiah talks in our passage about a remnant of the flock being gathered up by God. Now we think this probably refers to the Israelites who will one day return from exile in Babylon to help rebuild the temple and city walls of Jerusalem. Uh, that will be the Israelites that we read about in the book of Nehemiah. 
um, a bit later on in the Old Testament. Uh, so that's one kind of hope uh, that's flagged in our passage. But there's a second, and it's the second one that I want to focus on this morning. Because he goes on to talk about this righteous branch of David that God is going to rise up. And this is a really interesting little dig at the king, at King Zedekiah. Because that name Zedekiah in Hebrew means God is my righteousness. So what Jeremiah is saying to the king is basically, you're rubbish, but God is going to raise up a proper king who will be called, as, our, as we hear in verse 6 of our passage, the Lord, our righteous saviour. Basically, there's going to be another king who will succeed where you, King Zedekiah, have failed. Now, if you know uh, your church calendar, you'll know uh, that this Sunday is Christ the King. Uh, so it might not surprise you that I'm going to tell you that this promised king in our passage is King Jesus. Uh, but I do think it's worth pausing for a moment to think about Jesus specifically in the, in the context of contrasting him with these failed Jewish kings like Zedekiah. Uh, because what this promised righteous king means, what this Messiah means and would have meant to those Israelites facing deportation to Babylon, was that there was a king coming that they could rely on to care for them and to rule them properly. As Christians, uh, we can very quickly jump straight into freedom from sin, which is a good thing. Jesus brings us freedom from sin through his death on the cross, and that's to be celebrated and to be enjoyed. Uh, but the great thing about being Christians with the Christian Bible is we have that perspective uh, throughout the Bible. But actually, when we dwell with the Israelites and we dwell in the Old Testament a little bit, we can see another layer of understanding about who Jesus is. Because this passage points to Jesus being finally, at last, a king, a ruler that you can rely on. A nation that's been shortchanged by its kings for generations can look forward to the coming of a king that will be different. A king that will care about justice and righteousness. A king who will lead wisely and for the good of his people, which is what the Israelites needed to hear and know was coming all those years, over 2000 years ago. But actually, I think it's what we in the UK in 2022 need as well. When we feel let down by our leaders, whether they're national leaders, local leaders, church leaders, when we feel let down by those we trust and rely on, we need to know about the righteous leader that God has promised. King Jesus came and died on the cross and rose again. King Jesus, who will come again to put all things right. So we do have hope for the future of this wise and good leader. But what about the here and the now? Uh, because I really do think Christianity in the Bible speaks into the here and now. It's not all about some vague thing that's happening in the future when Jesus comes again. Well, I don't think it's really fair to expect our leaders to be infallible. Jesus is infallible, but then Jesus is God. We can't really hold humans to exactly the same standard. I'm afraid if you expect me to be exactly the same as Jesus in the way I lead our churches, then you'll be sadly disappointed, not least with the quality of the wine supplied. Uh, but I do think there's a message here for both those of us who are leaders and those of us who are desperately looking for a shepherd to look after them. I read you a few words from the ordination service earlier, and I just want to read you the words that directly follow those ones I read to you earlier. Uh, the bishop goes on to say, You cannot bear the weight of this calling in your own strength, but only by the grace and power of God. Pray, therefore, that your heart may be daily enlarged and your understanding of the scriptures enlightened. Pray earnestly for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We can't expect everyone we trust to be exactly like Jesus. But we can pray for them. We can pray that those we, we rely on may have God at work in their hearts, that he will give them a heart for justice and righteousness. And as we pray that, it's not unfair to expect God to answer that prayer. We don't actually go into a voting booth to vote very often. And if things go well in a church, we don't appoint new vicars very often. Uh, we hope to only walk up the aisle once in our lifetimes. Sometimes maybe we might do it more than once, but it's certainly not an everyday occurrence. We don't get to choose who our parents are 
or what our children are like. But there is something we can choose to do. There's something that we can choose to do every day. In fact, two things. Firstly, we can choose to pray for the people we trust, either because we've made a choice or because that choice has been imposed on us. We can pray that King Jesus will be at work in them by the Holy Spirit and that we may be able to trust them because we can see signs of his kingdom in their lives and works. Uh, the Book of Common Prayer, uh, we've started doing quite a few of those services now. And I'm struck how often how following the Book of Common Prayer means we're praying for our government, we're praying for our clergy, and we're praying for all those that make up the body of Christ every week, because actually we trust that God can be at work in them and God can help them to be good leaders. Not exactly as good as Jesus, but in the right direction in modelling Jesus and following Jesus. And secondly, when we find ourselves in positions of trust, we can pray that God will help us to be worthy of the trust that others place in us. We can pray that God will help us to be trustworthy and he will help us to follow the example of the ultimate trustworthy King, King Jesus. Because I think that's the point of Christ the King Sunday, that wherever we are, whenever we've been let down by those we trust, whenever we've let down those who have trusted us, there is a fully trustworthy King whose name is Jesus. And Jesus' kingdom is coming. And if we ask, his kingdom can be at work in the kingdoms and the places that we inhabit here and now, even if it's only a foreshadowing and a taste of what that perfect kingdom is going to be like. So let us pray. Lord God, we thank you so much that you love us and you care for us. We pray now for all those in positions of trust. We pray for our government. We pray for our church leaders. We pray for those we trust and rely on, our friends and families. Help them and empower them to be worthy of that trust, to use that trust and live in a manner in keeping with the values of King Jesus and his kingdom. We pray for ourselves as well. Help us to be worthy of the trust that people put in us. Help us to model Jesus' kingdom values in all we do and say. Amen.